Um, and thank you for joining uh, this workshop organized by the EU project HR Recycler. And the workshop entitled Working Side by Side with Robots, Human Factors in Industrial Settings. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, within uh, HR Recycler. It's uh, Anna Mura from EBAC, uh, Sarah C. Uren from uh, Technalia, Apostolos, uh, and Alex from uh, SEDS. Um, in Greece. So, and thank you to, for the collaborating EU project that um, will be sharing with us some some of their work. So, um, next, so maybe Sarah, you want to say a few words about our uh, project, uh, the HR Recycler, quickly. Uh, yes, um, HR Recycler is a European research project research project of three years. Um, we are now in the second year of the project. And this HR Recycling project is related to recycling of electric and electronic devices and introducing collaborative robotics um, to, help, to help operators with manual, dangerous and time consuming uh, tasks. Um, in this project, we intend to create a hybrid collaboration environment uh, where humans and robots will harmoniously collaborate and work. So this workshop, this organization is inside the dissemination tasks of the project. So um, I think this is all from my side. Uh, refer to HR Recycle. Anna? So next slide. Yes, so um, what's the goal of this workshop is to explore some aspects of the human robot collaborations uh, and uh, that are relevant for the integration of the robot worker with the human worker in the industrial uh, environment in such a way that we create, um, let's say, we explore the possibility to create hybrid human robot collaborative environments where uh, humans and robots will work together. Uh, next. So to do that, uh, so we explore these human factors in human robot collaboration that include trust and adaptability to autonomous machines. Uh, in order to pursue collaborative tasks. All the human factors have to do with uh, accountability. Uh, and in that sense, we will explore the legal rights and the obligations uh, that we have towards the humans and the machines, as well as with these human factors have to do with economic, with the economic and the social uh, impact. Next slide and we will do that uh, in three sessions uh, during the workshop exploring each of these uh, factors uh, with different speakers and that have different expertise and uh, just to um, uh, for the first session we will look at how what are the needs uh, that we have to bring in uh, the human like uh, factors that we have to bring in in order to improve uh, trust and acceptance as well as in session two uh, we will look at actually mm, the mutual adaptation in particular in settings and in session three we will look closely with experts uh, in ethics and um, the, the regulations also the EU level for instance in different uh, different fields of age and human robot collaboration. So, but without hesitation, uh, yeah, <laughs> go next. We go to then uh, the first, um, so we, we start right on time. Uh, we, we, we go to the first speaker uh, um, of the first session, Trust and Acceptance in, a, in, in Human Robot Collaboration. Paul Vercher uh, is an ICREA professor um, and uh, also researcher at uh, the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia. Uh, in Barcelona, and uh, his interests are mainly, um, mainly among many, uh, theory of mind and brain, um, neuroscience, uh, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Well, he will talk to us today um, on empathy uh, in humanoid robots. And so, with that, I will open the floor uh, to you all. You have 20 minutes. People can post questions in the chat uh, and post questions uh, after the talk. There will be five, 10 minutes uh, questions, uh, time for questions, and there will be a discussion at the end of the, of the presentation. So, uh, take it away, Paul, and uh, thank you, everybody.
You are muted, Paul. Paul, you're muted. Hello, hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm such a modest person, you know. Okay. All right, so here we go. Um, I will talk about uh, synthetic empathy or how we're going to get there, but also what its function actually is or is supposed to be. Because in uh, empathy is often thrown around like this is the the, the silver bullet, uh, the, the magic bullet to solve all the problems in human robot interaction. But I think there's a lot more to it, and I would like to unpack therefore more the fundamental question: What does it take? to build um, trustworthy AI or trustworthy robotic systems, right? So this is a work done at the SPECS Research Lab in Barcelona, where, of course, with, with many members of the lab and all the work I'm, I'm describing to you is the result of team a team effort. So I'm just a talking head, but there are many other people behind it, uh, and we should never forget that. In addition, of course, a lot of European support. So in the HR Recycler project, we are responsible for the cognitive architecture uh, task planner in the human robot interaction setups and also for the moral engine. And that's also something Ismail will talk about later. And you might think like, oh, well, that, that's some, some sort of hobby philosophy project. But the point is, as soon as you talk about interaction between humans or between humans and machines, you very enter this domain of the invisible rules of interaction, uh, which is to do what are good actions in that sense of what are bad actions in the broader context of um, human and uh, human machine coexistence, right? So this very quickly brings you in this domain of, of moral decision-making. And there I think these features we're talking about, including empathy, play an important ingredient in the cognitive architecture that can bring us to that point. Okay, so as you know, robots right now are often strongly segregated from humans because we don't understand how to address these problems. So we better say, well, let's put the robot in a separate metal cage and we make sure there are no humans around but the robot functions and in that way we don't have to solve that issue. But I think uh, the issue is coming our way anyway, especially because uh, the EU now in April announced it's new regulation for artificial intelligence and robotics is part of that, right? So you're seeing clause uh, 13, the robotics and AI strategy for, for Europe is, is uh, tightly intertwined. And of course, being active in this field, that should not surprise us because a lot of control techniques, uh, machine vision techniques, learning te techniques are right now part of this blooming field of, of artificial intelligence, right? Um, so we have to deal with this whether we like it or not so robotics is changing in that sense which i think is also a very um, welcome challenge because it's it, that means robots also go beyond and robotics will go beyond only the megatronics of the system but also really more about the complex uh, control aspects of dealing with properties of if you want invisible worlds um so uh, th there are a number of very concrete recommendations um, which will also impose the requirements on, on companies and, and others who produce these kinds of AI techniques, including robot techniques, that will make them trustworthy. And very central elements in that is transparency uh, and human oversight, right? So that humans can understand what robots do or what AI systems do and why they do it. So this uh, of course, we are all aware this, this is a massive challenge for AI systems. They're very opaque. That's also why they're compared to voodoo, uh, voodoo technology, because in the end, we don't really explain, cannot really explain for most of these techniques why they do what they do. But now Europe laid down the gauntlet, and we have to actually deal with this issue of transparency and trustworthiness. And there, I think the challenge of empathy plays a very uh, central role. And as you know, they're also now very concrete guidelines uh, specified by the, the high level uh, group on uh, trustworthy AI uh, on how this can be achieved. But 
If you look at their seven main characteristics, right? So I left out privacy and data governance. If you really want to solve this, right? right um, robustness and safety, uh, transparency, diversity, and so on. In the end, we talk about very advanced synthetic. Uh, and I think that that's a great challenge. This opens the door for, for whole new forms of research that so far have been um, nascent and, and not really fully addressed. But I think if, if Europe now wants to be serious, we have to make significant progress on building, building full-fledged synthetic minds with em empathic capabilities and moral reasoning capabilities. And I want to sort of look at a few uh, experiments we've done along those lines to see what will be some of the core challenges to achieve that? A second strand we should be aware of is a very recent paper in Nature, where a group of AI uh, pioneers from some leading organizations announced that cooperative AI has to be uh, an important part of the future agenda. They also received a 15 million donation of a foundation to start a foundation for cooperative AI. Uh, uh, so these things are happening around us, and I think as as HR recycler, as the robotics community, HRI as specialist, we have something to contribute here. So let's do that. Now we have been looking at these questions of explainable AI in robotics in a project called uh, "What You Say Is What You Did," um, and it's all about how can we have a robot learn an ontology and actually communicate about this ontology uh, with human users. So I will show you some. So the project itself had, had quite some ambitions about a full flat robot uh, psychological control system, but I would like to show you some examples of how far we got in allowing this robot to make itself uh, explainable. And then we go back into this question of how empathy or this whole idea of understanding other in terms of self wasn't a fundamental ingredient in making this actually work. So here. I didn't have to leave my index finger. But how does it feel when I touch something? Can you touch my index finger when I do this? Please. So here the robot is learning a body map. So it has unknown features of its internal body map. And it asks the human to touch parts of its body. Okay, so it learns to build its body map in a transparent interaction using natural language with the human user. Now we'll go to the physical world. Okay, so now the robot has learned that this object is called a duck, and it does it by proactive labeling, and that means it has an internal model of the world, and uh, it, it interrogates the human about these unknown objects. Now we can go further and recognize objects and actions. So now it does action recognition of human users and it names that action also in the proper frame of reference. So in this case it's that you push the brain with your left hand. Right? So we, we, we have learned to label uh, objects, uh, the body of the robot itself and actions of the human user. And why this is relevant now, the robot has an autobiographical memory, so you can interrogate its experiences. So, Doc is now asking the robot what it has been doing in the in the session. What happened finally? Why do you have the octopus? Why? I 
Now, so this was a breakthrough in robotics research because here we have a robot who, for the first time, is introspecting itself, right? And so you, the robot in the end says, I took the octopus because I want the octopus, right? So it can declare its motivations that were informing its actions. Okay, in a par parallel uh, activity, we, we can look at this as koala parsing, right? A robot interpreting its experiences and explaining them to the world. Koala is this idea of the quality of, of conscious experience. Now, the architecture behind this uh, is called the distributed method control, which is a multi-layered uh, architecture where, where we basically assume that, um, well, I have, no, I have no pointer, it seems, okay. Um, where, we well, we see your call. We you do? See. Yeah, we do. Okay, well, I don't, I don't. So that's not helping me. Anyway, so um, if you look at the right-hand side, uh, Deck is basically saying that that, that controls uh, the brain evolved as a control system that is multi-layered, from the body or the somatic layer to a reactive layer where you have immediate reflexive actions to an adaptive layer where you acquire states of the world and states of the body of the agent, and on top of that, the last layer, the contextual layer, you link these representations of perception action pairs together in behavioral policies uh, modulated by values and goals so these are the, the core concepts but what's in and then to translate it into language uh, peter domeni and his and his colleagues then at inserm in, in lyon and now he's in montpellier um, used um, recurrent neural networks or reservoir computing to transform the internal representations the robot had acquired at this contextual layer into linguistic expressions, so natural language, but linked here in green, fundamental in getting this organized, you can imagine if the robot engages with the world and it builds up a database in some sense of stuff that's happening, objects, events, relations, agents, and so on, that, that in itself is not immediately structured for humans to understand. And what we imposed on this is a concept that comes from psychology and also the linguistics of the situation model. That is, that actually in order to transform internal representations into a mind dump that another agent can comprehend, you must impose a, a set of prior criteria, which they call the situation model, and the situation model um, is very much centered on a notion that we call uh, H5W, which I will now explain to you. So, um, okay, DEC is a multi-layered uh, architecture, uh, as I explained to you, that we have mapping to the brain. But what the center here, one second, I close the door. I'm surrounded by very needy uh, appliances, so uh, apologies for that. Um, um, so what, what Deck is basically saying is these different layers of control are not necessarily fully dominant continuously, right? If I have a very primitive uh, reactive form of, of robust, rigid control, like a reflex, like in a di direct feedback control system, I can deploy that, for instance, in emergency situations, but I will not be that flexible, right? So if if I have to deal with more complex tasks, I have to engage with more memory dependent systems. And this might be slow, it takes time, I have to learn and so on. So we see these control architectures as always solving a trade-off boundary between different kinds of requirements, like in this case, complexity of task versus the speed and robustness of the response. So an architecture is a dynamic controller and not in that sense fixed in its in its features. And I think this will be also a critical role if we want to understand how to get to this explainable AI driven by an other like self empathic interpretation. So footnote, we have shown how extent AI approaches can be captured in this nomenclature, uh, such as for instance, AlphaGo and, and other models, uh, and the same holds for dominant models of cognitive architectures 
in robotics. So it's a very, it's also a framework in which we can look at how people deal with integration problems as domain. But let's now get back to how we produce this situation model so that you can actually have an explainable uh, AI robot solution. And at the heart of that was this concept of H5W that we elaborated with Stefan Lallet, where we basically say maybe an ontology has a fixed structure. And this fixed structure is strongly related to how every agent is dealing with the task. And that fixed structure is essentially captured on the one hand in what we call H for W. That is, there's a why, there's a motivation, there's a goal. There's a what, there are objects in the world that pertain to this, and these objects are positioned in the world, and also the agent itself is localized, and then there's time, there's a when. But on top of that, there is also, this has an evolutionary argument that, that I will not elaborate on too much, there's a who. And this is the fifth element of an ontology, so that's, that's how we get to H5W, where now the who relates to, if you want, the H4W of other agents. So, so the who is, is a very essential feature in how we deal with social environments, also in human-robot interaction, this will be a fundamental component, but there's something very special about it. And that's also what I alluded to earlier, it is invisible, right? So this H4W of the other agents that I might look at, is fully hidden from me. And indeed, agents might signal those through their gestures, their posture, their facial expression, and so on, but that's not necessarily always to be trusted because also we deceive. And in some sense, to protect our person, we have to deceive. So, is this signal meant for me or? Yes, you oh. have only a few minutes to go, so. All yeah. right, so I better get to my conclusions. Um, so the other like self is an entry point in that invis invisible world of the other agent. And to enter that world, we need on the one hand a, a, a system for empathy, which is, okay, uh, what is the value, the emotional value of the state of the other, which requires a theory of mind. You must have a, a model you can only interpret the state of the other along the lines of a model, which is linked to your emotional system. But this emotional system is only reflecting your personal interaction history with the world. So the emotional grounding of the theory of mind that leads you to empathy is by necessity grounded in the history of the self. Now, empathy in itself is meaningless as long as it's not tied to an exact the function of sympathy. That means to translate this now in a proper response. So empathy often is linked to very direct emotional systems. Emotional systems are robust, fast, but they're relatively stupid. So these more often be defensive responses, like bystander effects. Something terrible happens to somebody else and no one does anything. They're very empathic. They feel what the other might feel, but they're not acting. So if you want to have active HRI in that respect, we have to transform this empathic emotional interpretation, other like self, in terms of a sympathetic response that means appropriate action in that world. And the foundation behind and in order to achieve this point in, in robot control systems is what we call virtualization. That means, as I tried to explain to you earlier here, I, I can only build the theory of the other and define proper responses if I can build models of the other. That means I must virtualize beyond what I can see of the physical thing, the other agent. I have to apply a model to that other agent. And then within that model space, I must respond. So there are examples of this. So for instance, in um, the famous work by Franz de Waal, who analyzed the bonobo cultures and societies uh, in great detail, he sees for instance, reciprocity and empathy in these in these environments as the foundational building blocks of the morality they built in order to build social cohesion. So to make multi-agent interaction work, these will be the two fundamental pillars. But as I just showed you, empathy will require virtualization. Uh, another example is for in, in B research, where you can see that yes, we are famous, we are aware of the von Frisch uh, Waggle dance, but 
there are also stop signals. So if an observing bee sees the dancing bee pointing in the wrong direction, they will headbutt the dancing bee to make it stop so that it does not misinform the, the hive about where nectar can be found. So here, control architectures that we want to build in HRI should deal with a trade-off between fast, robust, more emotional and empathic responses versus acquired and more complex sympathetic responses that are contextualized and take all aspects into, into account. This is if you want the theory of consciousness that I will not talk about. We have directly, but I guess we're running out of time now, uh, we have directly validated this theory about the virtualization that, that we assume is essential in building these features, other like self, in the human brain. So on the one hand, here there has been work uh, on, um, well, we should just jump through this. We have done work on intracranial patients um, who are uh, in hospital being observed uh, for their epilepsy. Uh, we expose them to tasks in virtual reality, which I don't have time really to describe in detail. And what we did, we extracted descriptors of brain states across all these electrodes we had in the brain that would try to that would tell us something about how they represent being in a certain location, seeing a certain image. And of course, you can say, well, this has nothing to do with other agents, and that is true. But what we try to test here is this virtualization feature of the brain. And it's a much longer story. I apologize. I can't explain to you the details, but maybe the question and answer gives us time for that. But here, um, what is going on? Okay. Um, here we have uh, encoding time, the first time you are in a room and you see something. And this is when we ask you whether you have seen the same thing. This area indicated here this region of interest indicates where the brain response was similar so the whole response across the brain where we were looking was similar but what was really very exciting to us here is a remarkable time shift so a pattern that occurs after one and a half seconds is replayed almost instantaneously if you recall that pattern so this is a very direct signature of this virtualization that i talked about so we know that human brain can virtualize and now the next question is of course whether and here this is a uh, research done by uh, Sonia Tinga, Singer and her and her co-workers uh, where they have identified using fMRI research the core networks in the human brain underlying empathy compassion and theory of mind and our our hypothesis now is that also among these networks, we will observe similar signatures of virtualization that we have now found in direct memory encoding and decoding, because we believe it's this virtualization is a necessary feature to really achieve the self-like other model-based interpretation of the social world that is essential to build explainable AI and explainable robotics. So, uh, um, I know this was all a little bit uh, with, with some shortcuts. Um, the key thing is Europe is giving us a challenge here. It says that AI, and AI applied to robotics must be explainable. Well, that's that's easily more easily said than done. So I showed you with the WYSIWYG project that one way to move forward on that is to build robots, if you want, introspection using natural language. That robots can interrogate their internal models and de declare them in natural language. But for that, you need a translation, right? You cannot just dump these internal vectors straight on, on, on the computer screen. Underlying that, we to, to do this successfully, and that's what we show, demonstrated in this WYSIWYG project, you need an ontology. And we believe that this, this H5W uh, notion gives you a framework, a situation model to express that ontology. At the harder it stands, this other like self notion, right? So to realize this, we need virtualization. So the fundamental assumption was virtualization. And we showed that the human brain at least is doing that. And if we want to achieve moral machines and explainable AI, then this should be the core ingredient, virtualization memory that can allow both robots to, to prospect the future, do mental time travel, but also to understand their social environment and respond 
properly according to the norms and morality in the world in which we live. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Paul, for this very transversal uh, presentation on empathy. Um, uh, we we kind of running out of time. I don't know if anyone has uh, questions, um, direct questions now. Otherwise, we switch to um, the next uh, presentation, Ismail. Uh, but actually, uh, just a quick question to you. Maybe we can keep up with the discussion later on. How would you, in in a few words, translate this virtualization process? in a robot that is not a humanoid robot, but it's an industrial robot that is oh, embodied we're, we're, differently. How do you, in, in, you know, infer uh, empathy in, a, in an industrial robot? Maybe only a few words. It doesn't matter, Anna, for, from my perspective, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's all about memory systems. And okay. the memory systems are, are linked to the task environment and robots, as but as soon as a robot is interacting with humans, it needs a, a, a human compatible interface. And that's why human node robots are often a, a system of choice for HRI research. And also for industrial robots, we have to think about that interfacing. But the question of virtualization will be identical. The more you deal with the invisible of the other, mm -hmm. the more you must be able to virtualize and to also structure that virtualization around an ontological framework that I claim could be H5W. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we keep up with uh, with these questions later on, uh, later today. So then we switch to uh, Ismael uh, Freire uh, from uh, IBAC. Uh, his uh, research work uh, is uh, focused on cognitive science and psychology, and uh, its interests are uh, system design, uh, integration and control, and of course, real-time integration in artificial in, in, uh, systems. And today, he will talk to us um, about uh, towards morality-driven human robot collaboration, and also will bring the experience uh, within uh, that he's uh, pursuing in the HR recycler uh, project. So um, thank you, Ismail. So you can share your screen. Yeah. You see my screen now? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So thanks, Anna. Um, indeed, today I'm going to present uh, the work of morally driven human robot collaboration and the specific case of the HR recycling project. So, the first thing we have to deal with is with the notion of morality. Morality, we are all familiar with, with it since it's one of the key features of our human life. No, I mean, the uh, assume that morality refers to some behavior that can be right or wrong according to our own system of values, right? But being such a general aspect of our lives, also morality has been studied in a wide range of academic fields, and therefore also there are uh, many definitions or approaches to the study of morality. Mainly, uh, we're going to deal with two key definitions that also cut across most of the discipline. On one side, we have the normative or prescriptive account of morality, in which morality would be a code of conduct that, uh, given certain conditions, would be put forward by all rational persons. This is, has a prescriptive value of what people should do to consider a moral action to be such. And is mainly used in the philosophy and and other human sciences in the traditional sense of studying and building notions of uh, morality, uh, frameworks of moral thought. And in the, on the other side, in the more empirical and descriptive notion uh, understands morality as a code of conduct that has been put forward by a society or a group and is accepted by an individual for, for their behavior. And this is mainly the traditional uh, uh, notion that uh, anthropology, cognitive science, and empirical sciences uh, deals with. Um, uh, it's a more 
grounded on the observation of what human uh, societies do and consider as moral, moral and then abstract certain theories or principles based on, on this. Now uh, we're going to delve into the two main uh, and most popular uh, normative theories of morality that also have led to some of the earliest implementations in AI systems and robotics. That is basically the utilitarianism and the ontological schools of, uh, of morality. Utilitarianism, in one hand, assumes that morality implies a certain maximization of a utility notion that is uh, a measure of happiness, no? like maximize pleasure or, or avoid or minimize pain would be the maximum uh, for a moral act to be assessed. And uh, on the other hand, the ontology, uh, famously put forward by Kant, uh, evaluates the actions themselves as being morally justified or not, regardless of the consequences. So it's, uh, it focuses more whether an action would be um, immoral or not, no matter the context, such as stealing will always be bad or killing will always be bad. In popular culture, thanks to the advent of uh, also self-driving cars, it has been popularized this kind of moral dilemmas no, that actually put these two schools in conflict, you know, since they bring different predictions of what this, uh, this guy should do in this kind of uh, trolley dilemma, as, as it is known, in which this uh, trolley is uh, going uh, fast in this rail and might kill five people, and this uh, person has the chance to choose whether to turn the divert by switching the the rail divert the the trolley and kill just one people, one person, versus uh, letting it go and killing uh, five. So utilitarianism would uh, would predict or claim that the moral action would be to divert the, the trolley, whereas the the ontological school would say that uh, you uh, the the person would never should never uh, uh, divert the trolley because it will also kill a person and the action would be bad. So it should let the trolley stay. Um, this uh, conflict has also been a source of discussions on how also could be uh, these two different notions implemented in artificial systems have brought also not only this dilemma but all, all other practical uh, issues to, to, the, to the debate. Um, on how to actually assess what would be the better system to put in this in this kind of uh, systems, such as self-driving cars, and uh, how to implement them in, in, in a way. And traditionally, there have been two main uh, implementation strategies. No, the, the more common in the in the early 70s, 80s have been the top-down. Uh, approach to building this kind of cognitive architectures that is based on some uh, expert representation or uh, prior knowledge uh, that is uh, embedded in the system by the by the human expert and uh, somehow this this implementation of moral system will um, follow a explicit implementation of these codes with the high capacity of symbolic reasoning uh, as a pro however it has a important drawback that that is that these computational demands of this kind of calculations can scale very rapidly if the problem is uh, is complex and um, this can happen both to analyze the consequences of an action but also uh, the university validity of of, a, of an action in the deontological case in the case of the other strategies more modern and robotic based approaches from bottom-up architectures have uh, based uh, their in the implementation of moral systems in a more implicit manner on the system, building or uh, combining certain behaviors uh, or simple behaviors to to produce uh, a, a specific a specific goal or uh, a specific behavior or follow a specific rule. Uh, these systems are indeed very good at embodiment and autonomy. Uh, as they excel precisely in, in robotic tasks. However, uh, the application of these uh, systems to complex problems with the several goals can lead to also problems in implementing this or, or assessing uh, conflicting situations between moral 
uh, aspect. So there has been uh, theoretical and, and practical criticism to either of these approaches and either of these uh, of these uh, uh, schools precisely because also um, they are somehow um, covering only part of what uh, uh, cognitive sciences claim that uh, moral decision making is like it is Darianism and the ontology seems to be uh, taking place in in most of the uh, of our daily life and is not one or the other. So another uh, approach that is now uh, being put forward is grounding the moral decision making of these systems in a more empirical uh, grounds of the study of morality, such as the psychological, anthropological uh, sciences. In this case, theories such as moral foundations or morality as cooperation uh, work as uh, building hypotheses about how the function of morality in the evolution of our species, uh, uh, what, what was the function of morality in the evolution of our species, so it takes a more pragmatic uh, assessment of, of what morality is by studying the cultures across the globe and trying to infer certain general principles and certain variations. Uh, so in, in this kind of work, they try to assess and categorize this, this kind of moral principles and assess also the universality according to uh, huge cross-cultural studies that now can be done uh, technically. Um, Regarding these principles uh, and the definition of morality based on this latest uh, research, morality is now being considered from the psychology and the anthropological sciences in, as a collection of both biological and cultural solutions to the problems of cooperation and conflict that is recurring in human social life. And the, the key here and the, the element to highlight is how in, in these theories cooperation plays a central role or is actually the main function in which these uh, theories of morality and morality as such uh, is uh, grounded as a precise solution to the different cooperation problems that society has. Also, uh, these uh, moral principles and these theories have been predicting uh, several moral pr principles that have been validated and found across many cultures across the globe, not only Western industrialized uh, rich uh, societies. Also, another aspect to highlight of these studies is the uh, uh, harm aversion uh, uh, core principle that also builds and, and constructs this, this theory uh, based on also psychological research and in, in cognitive neuroscience as well, that grants both cooperation and, and conflict uh, solutions to, to, to morality. So from this, we extract two key elements that we will apply to the, uh, to the particular project uh, in which we are going to see now the, the implementation of both harm avoidance and cooperation as the key elements building the human robot interaction in this, in this project. For those of you that do not know the HR Recycler project, it's a European project that aims at a sophisticated uh, human robot environment that implements a hybrid recycling plant to deal with uh, we products, electronic equipment. And uh, a core feature of this project is the close uh, collaboration between human and robot, uh, both in all range but also in general in the, in the whole system. We have a, a then uh, both issues of first avoiding harm and then dealing with cooperation as one of the core tenets of how to deal with human-robot interaction in, in this kind of systems that also have the uh, complexity of being an industrial setting in which we have to also take into account the variability and the complexity of these changing environments. So in the context of this project, we implement these two moral principles in two uh, key uh, ways. The first one is implicitly following a value-centered, uh, human-centered design approach to human-robot interaction and AI that is also being put, put forward, as Paul has presented, by the European Union, and explicitly by the creation of a moral engine that is a control module that will deal with the dynamic uh, regulation of such principles. 
in particular the implicit implementation that I was talking about implies that both ethical and moral considerations of both safety and cooperation must and has been considered already both in the design of the system and the development of the components. Um, in particular, for the moral engine, uh, the, the aim of, the, of developing this module is to have a control system to promote these two principles in the human-robot interaction domain and its goal is also to adapt it, uh, these principles to this industrial context of the interaction. It is based of, uh, on an allostatic control regulation that explicitly manages how to deal with certain equilibrium between different uh, variables, vi variables of, the, of the interaction. It will also have a cognitive component that will take into account information about the context of the interaction and also adapting to each of the persons with whom the system interacts. Following the human-centered design principles, the moral engine will be always active when a human presence is detected, and therefore also uh, the moral engine considers each person as a unique context. And based on this personalized information obtained by the worker model, that is an internal model of each of the workers that uh, the system has, the moral engine is able to adapt or modify the robot behavior to the workers preferences and also to the uh, being aware and regulate the, the current risks of the task that the worker is performing or the robot is performing. And therefore the adaptation of the robot behavior is based on both the person's preferences in order to seek also a, a, and promote more trustful human robot cooperation by taking into account the values and, and preferences of each of the workers in interaction. Also, of course, the, given the industrial setting, uh, additional layer of safety is built on the human, on the moral engine to uh, to provide a, a second level of uh, safety to the for the human, given the varying context of the of the of the task. And more concretely, the moral engine is designed to instrumentally promote the, this human robot level of cooperation by three key aspects. The first is integrating the contextual information, both from the environment, from the robot, and critically from the human worker, the internal state and levels of uh, assessed trust are being computed and, and integrated in the decision making of the moral engine. Also, is, uh, the key aspect of adaptate, adapting the robot's behavior by modulating these interaction parameters and contextual information. And as said before, also the harm avoidance prevention of uh, taking of avoiding any any risk or uh, dangerous action to uh, to take place so in a schematic way the moral engine has uh, three levels of, uh, of control in the in the higher level it integrates information both from the worker model of the worker, it also integrates information about the context of which action and process is uh, being uh, performed by the by the worker and the robot in the workbench, and also information about the robot whether is will, uh, within a, uh, some tool that might extend the reach and, and put in risk the, and the worker. The moral engine integrates this into a single context that it uses to adapt the control of uh, certain aspects of the human-robot interaction, such as how fast the, the, the robot moves and how uh, and the speed of the, of, the, of, the, of the translation of the robot through the space. In particular, the key element of the moral lending is the static control model that is at the center of the, of the moral lending, that is based on the uh, dynamic change of desired values of the lower level of static systems as we see before. Central to this uh, model, based on some biological models of uh, allostasis in, is uh, the notion of allostasis, that is the process of achieving certain stability of the internal system through the dynamic change of variables. And allostasis, that is the low level control of certain variables through the maintaining a constant desired value of such elements. The integration of these two levels takes place in the 
final uh, version of the model ending that integrates the set information from the making uh, uh, no information such as the trust and internal preference of the of the worker, adapting the the desired values uh, in the in the allostatic control layer of the homeostatic subsystem, therefore achieving a dynamic change of the of the of the security and speed of the according to both the risk of the situation and the uh, worker with in with whom the robot is interacting with. To finalize, uh, we can see a small uh, highlighting one of the tests of the model engine in the integration with other cognitive uh, elements of the system. In this case, the goal of this uh, demo was to achieve or to show how the human robot interaction could be dynamically regulated by the worker preferences and internal state. So, here, there is a system uh, by our partner Sadako that detects the distance and monitor distance between the worker and the robot. We have also the internal model of the worker in the, in the worker model database that is updated with values of uh, assessed or expected trust of the system. And uh, here we see how all is integrated in a in an industrial setting and uh, developing Sadako premises. Here we see how the system is detecting the worker by the ID in the helmet and how the both the robotic arm and the tablet uh, uh, showing the output of the system uh, are presented in the scenario. So here we will see how the worker approaches the, the robot in a, well, a bit exaggerated way to highlight the, the, the distances between both robot and, and human. And here we see how upon detection the worker model loads the information of trust and, and on, the, on the robots and the preferred interaction parameters and the model engine regulates the speed and also the uh, maximum distance at which the uh, robot should stop given the signal from the model engine. So the model engine is receiving through ROS in real time the information of both distance and the preferred uh, security levels that the, the worker might uh, have. In this case, this worker had a very low trust on the system, therefore the system was stopping the robot uh, at a much greater distance. In this case, uh, a different worker has been is in the in the scene, and in this case also both uh, uh, some internal parameters such as the interaction settings of language of the system, but also the trust levels of this worker are different, and we can see how he can approach to much closer distances, of course maintaining the minimum security between human and worker and robot, but uh, that these distances and detection is dynamically changed according to the presence of one or the other worker. And also, we will see how also the speed uh, will be changing in a much more detailed manner. Here we see the replay of the scene of the first worker. And now the second worker approaches to the robot that is behaving much faster and through a much closer distance. This is just one of the features that the model engine can perform. Also, we see the uh, example of speed regulation based on trust. And according to the, this is just the summary, a worker with a high level of trust on the, on the robots will perform faster and will uh, maintain a standard security distance, whereas uh, a worker that will uh, that is detected with low level of trust, the model engine will extend the security to make it make him comfortable and also perform much lower uh, dynamics. So here we have seen how the proxemics can be dynamically regulated, taking into account internal states and values of the worker and preferences to adapt the system to its comfort while maintaining functionality. So,
this Thank is you. all from my side. Great, uh, uh, very clear presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions. Can raise the hand. Maybe I have a quick question in terms of, I mean, this is very important to work on morality and a code of conduct, uh, right? Mm -hmm. But is it included in the in the code of conduct, some sort of punishment for the robot when it makes mistakes? And actually, how is this applied? We give the robots and self morality and all these cognitive tasks. How about punishment? But we can discuss it later if this is a little yes, but this will be an extension as this model is uh, is built for this uh, this particular task. We are trusting more on an uh, innate uh, control system that has to be fast and it doesn't show learning. It show dynamic adaptations through allostasis. Therefore, that's how we choose the allostatic control as the as the key element for the model engine because it can integrate different levels of information of different workers, also assessing risk and taking action fast. Of course, in a more autonomous uh, agent, uh, we might be interested in uh, adding learning and therefore punishment takes into, we need to take punishment into account, right? That will be... Yeah. Oh, oh, so, I keep some uh, questions for later and also I hope sure. everyone else has more question, questions. Um, and given the time, then we switch. Thank you again, Ismail. We switch to um, uh, we switch to Monica. Um, mm -hmm. so if you want to put your slides up? Yes. Uh, so, um, okay. Can you see them? Um, we we see you. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank so you. So let me quickly introduce you. Uh, Monica Malvezzi is associate professor um, at the University of Siena in beautiful Toscana. And uh, her uh, research interests are on robotics, mechanical engineering, and the mechanics of machines, but also learning and education, right? Because uh, in fact, your title is, as we can read, accessible education resources for teaching and learning robotics. So thank you very much for, for being here and uh, thank, you. thank you. Okay. Is it going? Okay. So thank you for inviting me to this uh, really interesting workshop. Um, a few words about uh, myself and uh, my research. I work uh, uh, at the University of Siena, the Department of uh, Information Engineering and Mathematics. Uh, probably you know Siena is uh, a medieval uh, city in the center of uh, Tuscany, and also the university is very ancient. It uh, was found found in the, in um, 1240, and uh, our department is a uh, on uh, information, information engineering and the mathemat mathematics, and there is a research group that works on uh, robotics. We have also a collaboration with the uh, Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia in uh, Genova. So our <clears throat> research group is called uh, Human Centered Robotics Group of uh, our departments, and our f main interests in uh, in terms of uh, research and uh, engineering development is about haptics, grasping, and manipulation and human robot integration. So this is uh, the uh, the team and uh, the the leader is uh, Professor Domenico Prattichizzo, and uh, there are. Uh, a great uh, uh, team of uh, PhD and postdoc uh, students that uh, are uh, working with us. So, as anticipated, uh, these are the main uh, topics of our research. Uh, so, uh, here I highlighted three main areas. Uh, one is about wearable haptics, so the de development of uh, uh, devices for haptics uh, uh, feedback. 
uh, that is uh, that are wearable, so that have not limitation in workspace. Another um, area in which uh, we study is uh, about uh, uh, the development of uh, um, robotic hands, in particular hands that exploit the concept of uh, uh, compliance and uh, softness to adapt to different objects uh, and different shapes and different uh, contexts. And uh, another area of research is about uh, human-robot integration and in particular human-robot uh, co-manipulation and also um, in the development of wearable um, robots that are um, that augment the structure of uh, the human body. In this presentation, I will uh, focus on, on something that is, uh, let's say, less technical. Um, it's about uh, the Inbots project. Um, Inbots is a CSA project that uh, is going to end uh, in actually yeah, at the end of June. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot the. the the exact date due to the the um, new dates. And uh, what's Inbots about? Inbots is uh, the acronym of Inclusive Robotics for a Better Society. So we are facing, we are living in a an era in which robots are becoming uh, common also outside factor factories and uh, rigid uh, production cells, and they are going to to be uh, common in, in our every everyday life, in, in, in several aspects of our everyday life. And uh, this is a, a change that challenges us uh, as engineering from the technical point of view, but uh, there is also there are also new uh, challenges and new opportunities. Uh, there is, of course, uh, uh, a new set of dangers and the responsibilities that have to be managed. And also, um, the, this quick uh, uh, evolution of robots make uh, difficult to understand the state from, for the society, the state of uh, technology status, and uh, this could lead, for example, to uh, negative perception or overestimated uh, expectations. So the role of uh, Inbots project is to bring together experts from uh, different uh, fields uh, and uh, to promote uh, a debate, a discussion about robotics from uh, uh, different uh, technical and non-technical points of view. And uh, in Inbots project, we uh, focus in particular on interactive robot robots that uh, is uh, a um, white wide term to indicate robots that uh, interact with uh, in close proximity with humans in a let's say non-structured environment so this is uh, uh, the um, a picture showing the consortium there are 25 partners from uh, several parts of uh, europe uh, there are partner pa partners from the technical uh, technical partners, but also business and uh, um, non-technical partners and uh, end users. So, um, okay, the main out outcomes of uh, this project are a set of uh, documents of uh, white papers that are, are available on uh, the website of, uh, of the project. And uh, in these slides, I summarized the the main um, the main chapter the main uh, uh, topics of these uh, uh, documents so they interest that they support to small medium enterprises the standardization problem legal ethics and social economical aspect intellectual property rights and uh, education and the impact on the, the society in general so if you want to um, to download, to, to look at uh, this document, you can download them from the website of the document. They are freely available. Uh, we have also, during the project, realized a set of uh, documentary videos. So um, they are available again in, from the website or uh, 
from our uh, project YouTube channel. There is a, a, a final um, documentary that will be soon ready. And uh, about our, our contribution for, for uh, the project, we focus in particular on uh, the education. So um, the main problem is that, uh, yes, robots are, are going outside, uh, are going in the, in the society, are going closer to humans, but and they are getting ready to be to work with in collaboration with uh, with the robots. But but uh, are we humans ready for collaborating with robots? This is the main question that we uh, ask to ourselves. And uh, of course, this uh, this question poses some um, other questions about uh, uh, socio-economical, legal, and ethical impact of robots, but also this is a challenge for the educational system that uh, has to promote and create uh, a common language for uh, understanding what a robot is. And uh, yeah, mm, in this new perspective, we, we can say that robotics is uh, an interdisciplinary subject that, that uh, uh, involves um, traditionally separated uh, domains. So, so there is uh, the domain, the, the one that we uh, as uh, engineering, uh, as engineer uh, started studying that is uh, the engineering domain. So the, so the technical part of the developing robots, so mechanics, electronics, computer science, control and so on. But uh, nowadays there is also other aspects. There are also other aspects. So, so the, for example, the human physical domain, uh, as you, as I shown in the big, at the beginning of uh, the presentation, we are developing uh, uh, robots that uh, are worn by the human body, so exoskeleton, external limbs, and so on. So this close interaction requires a knowledge that uh, a physical uh, of the physical domain of humans, so physiology, economics, anatomy and so on. But there is also a uh, non-physical domain, uh, human domain, so psychology, ethics, economic and uh, legal aspect that have to be considered. And uh, yeah, each of these, uh, of these uh, uh, matters have uh, their own language, their, their own um, concept, and uh, when we talk about robotics, uh, we, we need to uh, find a, a common base of, uh, of language, of uh, concept to, to foster this, uh, uh, this development. And uh, so the, the availability of accessible learning resources for different types of uh, backgrounds and different targets is uh, therefore very important. So uh, how we organized our work, uh, this is uh, basically the, uh, the index of our uh, final white paper, and this also summarizes um, how we uh, face this problem. So we focus, there is an important chapter regarding the, uh, the role of robots in, in the school, in the school education that is becoming more and more important in this uh, year. Um, in these years, uh, in particular, because robots are something, yeah, they are um, an object of uh, uh, of learning. So, uh, robotics is something that you need to know also at school. But uh, robots are also a tool for learning because they are uh, a nice tool that allows students to put in practice some uh, theo theoretical knowledge things for, for example, to mathematics and uh, physics concept. So there is a, an important part of uh, our study dealing with this part of the education. Uh, outside the school, um, yeah, there is the academia world in which uh, the, the robotics course are becoming uh, more uh, important, not only in the engineering um, sector. Uh, but we focused on uh, resources that are uh, accessible um, uh, not only in the university system but also outside. 
other chapters of our uh, work, so uh, uh, other tasks of our work in, involve the uh, exploitation of uh, virtual and augmented reality technologies for educating and training in, in robotics. And uh, in, especially in the last part of uh, the project, we also uh, tried to anal analyze the impact of uh, the recent pandemic uh, on uh, the uh, robotic education that was uh, very um, important. And uh, another point that we tried to, to, um, to do was uh, uh, building a community of teachers, learners and experts in educational robotics, so to foster the dialogue and uh, the discussion also in educational problems related to robotics. Um, okay, mm. so in this, uh, 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 I would like to focus a little bit on the um, accessible resources for uh, learning robotics out outside the school. And in this uh, uh, context, we uh, first uh, reviewed uh, some uh, a set of available uh, resources that uh, we can find, for example, on the internet. And uh, uh, the idea, yeah, we realized that uh, there is a, a huge amount of uh, learning material. And uh, what we did was uh, trying to provide a sort of map for orienting uh, a learner to find the, the teaching, the learning material um, suitable for uh, the the necessary uh, target and the necessary uh, background. And uh, as a first step, we divided, so we, we analyzed the available uh, resources and uh, we divided them in a set of uh, typologies. So uh, resources, resources requiring a sequential access, so in which they are the uh, accessible version of a traditional course, so in which uh, there are a set of lectures that have to be uh, uh, followed in a, a certain order to be fully understood. There are also a set of resources that have, are available in an uh, arbitrary uh, order, so the, the learner can choose the resource uh, without a, a certain pre, uh, order. And also there are a set of uh, uh, resources for hands-on learning. So in this uh, table, we've, we try to uh, make a sort of uh, um, general classification of these resources. In our uh, study, in particular, we focus on uh, massive online, uh, massive open online courses, the acronym MOOC, uh, lecture series, YouTube, YouTube thematic channels, but also we analyzed other type of resources. So, for example, podcasts, the talks, and as I anticipated, tools for programming and building robots. So, uh, the, one of the main uh, chapters was about uh, massive online courses. And uh, the, this is a, a resource that uh, is continuously uh, increasing in time, but uh, especially in the last year, it uh, had a, a quick uh, increase in terms of uh, uh, subscriber due to the pandemic impact. So, I I'm a bit late, so I can uh, skip some slides. So in our um, review, we, um, we classified uh, the available uh, massive online courses and we divided up according to the target, uh, to the target subject. We classified them also in terms of uh, content and organization, accessibility and cost, contents, potential users, and the required knowledge. Um, another type of uh, resource that we analyzed are the uh, lecture series that are available on uh, YouTube. And uh, yes, there are courses that are quite general, but uh, uh, 
there are also courses more specific for uh, some uh, specific topics. And uh, here I present, uh, yeah, we summarized the, the main uh, topics of uh, MOOCs and uh, lecture series. So um, nowadays the, the, the majority of courses are, are about robotic foundations, but uh, uh, there are also other subjects, and in particular there are uh, also non-technical uh, courses that are becoming uh, common. Uh, what we learned from uh, this uh, review is also how to design a learning resource. So, uh, what we, since this type of resource has to be accessible for a wide set of uh, potential users with different uh, background, we uh, understood that uh, it's uh, convenient to organize the, the learning material in a way that uh, is, uh, let's say, a sequential in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, required background. So we <laughs> call this uh, level uh, surfing for the basic knowledge, uh, snorkeling for the intermediate uh, knowledge level. For example, in our robotics course uh, is uh, the mathematical foundation of uh, robotic, uh, let's say, dynamics or kinematics. And therefore, there is a, a more detailed scuba diving uh, level in which we, yeah, we go in the very details of, uh, of the study. Okay, yeah, we also classified resources uh, accessible in an arbitrary order. So, for example, YouTube uh, um, thematic uh, channels and uh, podcasts and so on. These are resources that does not that, that do not need uh, a, a, a predefined order to be uh, followed. Here there are some very famous, I, I think you know, uh, these uh, two videos that are available on uh, YouTube. The interesting thing here is that if you analyze the, the distribution of uh, thematic channels on robotics, and uh, in terms of, uh, and you sort them in terms of uh, number of uh, views and uh, subscribers, in, yeah, there are the, uh, the main uh, companies related to robotics, for example, ABB, KUKA, Boston Dynamics, but uh, there are also thematic channels in which uh, that are not uh, related to uh, a company, but are more uh, related to education and that are very important in terms of uh, uh, number of subscribers. Okay, um, the final part of the document that you can uh, download is uh, reg regards the resources for on hands-on learning. So software, uh, tools for building a robot, a tool for learning how to program robots and so on. So just to conclude, the, the role of uh, these uh, accessible uh, resources is becoming increasingly important for the, first of all, for, uh, for a wide set part of, uh, a wide set of people, uh, including under undergraduate students, PhD, and so on. And in this uh, uh, part of our INBOS project, we try to provide uh, a map for orienting uh, a potential learner in finding the, the resource for uh, his or her needs. And um, in this analysis, we we not only uh, organized the <coughs> available resources, but we also learned how to design this type <coughs> of resources. And uh, yeah, we did this uh, from the beginning of the project uh, because we, we thought that uh, the, this was something useful for um, spreading the, the knowledge about robotics also for uh, people that have not a specific background but need to interact with robots, but this, uh, this need for of uh, accessible re resources became uh, particularly important in the last year due to COVID-19 pandemic that uh, <clears throat> caused a, a, a great uh, change in, uh, 
our everyday life and also in our uh, in the e educational uh, system. So this ends my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for this interesting presentation and this look, um, say, look into the educational okay. so uh, sorry approach. For delay, but I didn't see the chat while presenting. No, no, no worries. That's we're no here worries. for the speakers, not for the time. <laughs> right. No problem at all. Uh, so, do we have any questions for Monica, or uh, we leave it for later, perhaps? But I, I have a curiosity. Have you looked um, uh, from uh, in inbox how academia and industry, or if academia and industry are collaborating in in, in an educational effort to produce not only engineers but also people that can use the new robots of the future in industry, for instance. Yeah, this is a part uh, of uh, yeah our uh, our work package actually the collaboration with uh, uh, the industry in mm -hmm. not only in uh, in going uh, with uh, uh, in um, research project but also in the in the learning uh, process and uh, yeah we, we also. Uh, collaborated with uh, some companies that were uh, in, uh, involved in, uh, in inbox in realizing a specific training material and also uh, an I think uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, part is uh, involving the companies in providing for example workshop no um, webinars and uh, um, lectures inside our courses for presenting uh, the, 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 how the real robots uh, work in, in companies. Good. So we are actually, as a group at EBAC, at SPECS, our lab, we're very interested in educational robotics. And maybe um, later, uh, we, I see Maria Blanca is one of our PhDs. Uh, that studied uh, educational robotics in her PhD program. Maybe it's interesting. Is it? It will be interesting to look forward to to let's say broad yeah. discussion. Okay. Meanwhile, I think we are late, but it's a coffee break actually, so it's good. <laughs> I don't know if uh, you guys uh, want to take a coffee break, but it should be minimal, right? So we don't. Um, yeah, we can come back in 10 minutes or as soon as you're ready, uh, you moved from the chair and you went to take a coffee um, and we come back uh, quickly. So um, we continue uh, with uh, Valeria Villani. Uh, so just a quick break and uh, we'll see you in a moment. OK, thank you, Anna. See you.
Hi, Sara. Are you there? Yes, Anna. I, I just think tried that you just uh, share your yeah own presentation. You got it. <laughs> because I came out, I don't know what was happening before I could not share my slides. Yeah. So I don't know what was that. Yeah. It doesn't matter. At least we had plan B. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. But so now it's it's okay. And, yeah. Uh, we can start actually with this. Uh, we should... Valeria, yeah, Valeria should be over there, no? So, yes. So, Valeria, are you here? Okay, great. So, if you can now share uh, your slides, I will stop presenting and you can present. Okay. Yes. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So should I start? Um, okay, yes, it's 12.11. So welcome back, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Valeria, for uh, joining our, uh, our workshop. And uh, so just a few words. You're assistant professor at the University of uh, Modena. A beautiful place. Everyone knows Giacetto Balsamico, no? <laughs> exactly. And uh, so your uh, research interests are on uh, human robot interaction and human machine interface, and perhaps a bit more. So take it away. Valeria. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to uh, to present some of my activities at this workshop. And in particular, today I would like to talk to you about uh, the, uh, a European project that finished about one year and a half ago, and it was called the uh, Inclusive Project. So, um, okay, it was, uh, I mean, the consortium was made of, uh, I think it, we were 11 partners, so some uh, technical, of course, we had three different use cases, uh, which I'll just show you later, and some integration partners. And uh, so, what was it about, and what uh, did we do during the project? Uh, the, the starting idea was that, uh, uh, I mean, we were focused on production systems, so on manufacturing industries, and uh, in particular, we focused on uh, human-machine interaction, so on the presence of human operators in, um, in factory systems. And the starting point of the, uh, of the whole project was that uh, on the one side, we know that modern production systems are becoming increasingly advanced from a technological point of view. But on the other side, the presence of human operators is still fundamental in industrial, in industrial workplaces. And uh, they, they must be there to supervise machines, to coordinate operation of machines. And the problem is that all the complexity of machine falls on subjects, on human operators who are called to deal with such increasing, increasing complexity. And uh, the, 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 the tools um, that human operators use to interact with the machines and to manage uh, and organize the, the activities of machines are, of course, human machine interfaces. And so the result of uh, technological progress becomes that human machine interfaces are getting always more, more and more complex. And uh, they are typical, typically, uh, they have a sort of static presentation of information, static in the sense that such interfaces are typically equal, are typically the same for any type of user and do not take into account the fact that users and specifically human operators have different skills, different roles, but also different capabilities and, and backgrounds. And so the, the idea was that of uh, trying to reverse the standard paradigm according which uh, human operators have to adapt to the machine and so to revert it and try to 
designed some machines that adapt to, to the human to the human operator. So uh, the idea was that of introducing some adaptive automation systems where adaptation is not from a technological point of view, so production related, but rather uh, it is related to human capa capabilities. So it's a sort of anthropocentric adaptive, uh, adaptive automation. And in particular, the, the, the goal of the project from which the name comes is that of uh, uh, allowing an individual to work with, um, with advanced technologies in, in factories. And in particular, we focused on three different um, classes of um, target users or of operators who are the elderly, uh, because the working force is, of course, getting uh, getting older, and people with some suffering from some disabilities, either physical or cognitive, and those who are simply inexperienced, such as young operators or seasonal operators. And so the, the final the final goal was that of developing an, an ecosystem of innovation uh, that consisted in introducing human factor analysis in industrial use cases, in industrial shop, shop floors. So this was our uh, ultimate goal. To achieve this goal, uh, we devised a, a system which mm, I'll call in the remaining of the presentation as inclusive system uh, that, was, that consisted in three main modules, uh, which were then merged all together in the, in the final system. And uh, these, these modules were uh, measure, adapt, and teach. So in particular, we started, we said that, okay, if we want that machines or human machine interfaces in the, spe in the specific adapt to the human operator, we need to know something about the human operator. And in particular, we need to uh, know, to, to measure some, uh, his or uh, her capabilities in order to understand uh, what, is the, what is the starting point and what is the current state of the, um, of the human operator. Once we know this information, then we can try to find, we, we sought for uh, ways to adapt the interaction of the system. So basically to adapt the behavior of the machine and the, uh, the, the behavior of the human machine interface to the measured capabilities of the, of the human. And uh, additionally, uh, if, this, if this adaptation was not enough, then we provided an additional, an additional pillar, an additional module that consists in providing additional teaching um, facilities and training to list skilled users or to operators who uh, did need some additional help from, from the system uh, in addition to the adapted behavior. And the, as I said, the goal was that of uh, allowing a work environment that is inclusive to any, to any user and in particular to the specific characteristics of the that I mentioned before, elderly, uh, disabled and inexperienced. And, uh, uh, and again, we wanted to achieve this in order to have an inclusive work environment, in order to improve production, of course, but also in order to improve and enhance worker satisfaction. So um, now I'll go through the three pillars and then we will see how we put them together in, in the use cases. Uh, as I said, the starting point was that of trying to build a model of the user, of the human operator, uh, in the sense of trying to understand what are the features, what are the characteristics of the users that have an impact on their, uh, on their working performance, on their working activities, and on their state during, uh, during working sessions. And uh, uh, so the first step was that of identifying uh, these characteristics of the user. And then, of course, we had to understand how to measure such characteristics. So we started from an analysis of the human behavior 
for uh, in working context, in industrial uh, working context. And in particular, so we, we had uh, a deep analysis of human behavior and of the factors that influence human behavior. And some factors uh, come from, from the human uh, themselves, so there are some internal influences that of course influence our, our performance, our working attitude and our working behavior. And, uh, but this, uh, I mean, our working behavior is also influenced by some external factors uh, that are, for example, the environment where we are or the task that we are uh, called to, um, to perform. So at the end, we had this list of uh, nine factors that are relevant in this context, so in the context of human workers or human operators in, in factories. The following step was trying to understand how we can measure uh, these, these factors and in particular how these factors are measured in the literature or they can be measured in general and how these measurements uh, or whether these measurements can be applied in a working context such as a factory shop floor. So um, in particular the measurement techniques were uh, separated in uh, constitutional which do not change uh, during uh, during the, the working session and some measurements that are situational in the sense that they might change during the work session. And for each of them, as I said, we identified a list of possible measures, but um, what I want to focus here is that uh, the measure pillar, okay, as needs to cover all these uh, all these factors, but some might be measured at the beginning or once when, let's say, when the uh, human worker is hired at the company or at the beginning of the working day, while the others, which are the situational, uh, need to be monitored in, in real time while the while the human worker is. Uh, is working indeed. And uh, let me try if I can. Okay, so. Okay, so this is a sort of an overview of the measure pillar. Mm, as a result, we have a number of uh, factors that we need to measure. Some, some can be measured uh, once and the other need to be measured during the working, during the working tasks. This information is an input for the two following pillars, which is the ADAPT, which are the ADAPT and the TEACH pillar. In particular, as regards the ADAPT pillar, we said that the goal of this pillar is that of uh, understanding how we can adapt the interaction and in particular the behavior of the machine and the user-machine interface. So uh, we wanted to define some general methodologies that can guide the adaptation of the, of the system. And to identify these, these methodologies, we started from considering the concept of situ situation awareness, which is something that uh, tells us uh, how a subject is aware of what is happening, and in the specific tells us how much the worker is aware of the working task that he is scared that they are carrying in that are carrying out. And in particular, in order to achieve complete situation awareness and let's say to dominate the working, uh, the working scenario, the, the working task, um, it is important to understand this, these three questions. So situation awareness goes through three different levels, which, is, which refer to first understanding what is happening, and uh, so basically uh, um, perceiving what is happening and then uh, understand why that is happening and then the next step is trying to um, predict what will happen next so for example if i click this button on the user interface what will happen next so something like that so the goal for um, 
a complete understanding of uh, an interaction task and a working task in this, uh, in this context is that of achieving complete situation awareness with respect to the, to the context. Okay, if we want, so the, the, the ADAPT pillar, as the goal of the ADAPT pillar is to uh, enhance or to favor situation awareness of the operator. And uh, in order, so we identified three different levels of the ADAPT pillar that correspond to these three different levels of the situation awareness concept. In particular, in order to favor the understanding of what is happening, we need to focus on uh, how the information is presented on the user interface and in particular provide some adaptation at the perception point of view or at the perception level. And moving upper in this triangle of situation awareness, in order to favor, to facilitate the comprehension of what is, of why it is happening, and then we need to work on some sort of cognition adaptation. So we need to adapt what information is presented by the machine, by the system, to the user in order to uh, allow the user to um, understand the context of what is happening. And um, finally, also, regarding the uh, perception adaptation and the understanding of what is happening, it is important also to uh, adapt or to, yeah, to adapt the way interaction, interaction is enabled and basically the interaction modalities and the interaction means to, means to communicate with, uh, with the machine. So, from the three levels of situation awareness, uh, we devise that the adapt, the adapt pillar should be organized according to three different levels. Let's say you should answer these three different questions related to perception capabilities, cognition capabilities. Okay, is it already five minutes left? Okay, and interaction capabilities. And uh, uh, as a result, we derived some general adaptation rules that take into account uh, universe, general principle designs for human-machine interaction coming from universal design or general design. And as regards the teach pillar, it consists in two different parts, which are an initial offline training, basically uh, in virtual reality, so that the user uh, can get uh, familiar with the working environment and uh, an online, tra uh, online training providing support while the user is, is working. So, for example, with the use of a portable devices or a portable device or augmented reality. Okay, so uh, as I said, the measure pillar goes in input to the adapt and teach and we have an offline measurement and teaching part and online adaptation measurement adaptation and teaching uh, we had three different use cases uh, for uh, with different with three different industrial contexts that are representative of the vulnerable users we are targeting and of uh, european industrial scenario and probably I would skip this, this video, it was about the demo case, so it's nice, but let's skip to the well, result. Well. Okay, so just some, some quick results from the use cases. In particular, I focused on one of the use cases, which was related to uh, a company producing woodworking machines, which are typically used by uh, elderly artisans uh, running their own small companies. So people uh, who are uh, very expert in woodworking, but not that expert, uh, might be not that, not that expert in the use of technology and in the use of advanced technological systems. And the interesting mm, mm, feature of this use case was that we could compare the proposed system, our proposed system, with their customary um, user interface that they 
typical use, I mean, from, from this company, which was one of the partners of the project. And uh, we could measure the, uh, the benefits from the inclusive system, both in a quantitative manner, so assessing the increase in productivity in terms of time and uh, the number of errors made by operators. But also we can we had some subjective measurement of uh, overall satisfaction of, of the system, which was quite high. Uh, we performed a, a usability analysis comparing the, the, the proposed, I mean, the inclusive system with the customary system, and the perception of the user was uh, definitely better. Uh, with the inclusive system rather than, than the other one. So they really found it helpful and, uh, and useful. And also user satisfaction was rated quite, quite well. So they were quite satisfied with the system, although, although of course we, we implemented a prototype in, in the company, but nevertheless tests were carried out with real artisans and we are real end users. So just to, to conclude, I hope I did not um, go too, too fast and uh, I did not put too many information, but um, I mean, the, uh, the, the goal of, the, of our work and of the entire project was that, uh, I mean, was moving the interest from the technological point of view or progress in the technological point of view in for automation systems to human operators because uh, we can go as far as we want with technology but still the presence of human operators is fundamental and advances in technology becomes a directly translating to complexity for human operators. So we need to find a balance or, I mean, it's getting too, too unbalanced and we need to find a sort of balance. And our proposed idea was that of um, designing automation system around the user and in particular uh, designing a system that adapts its behavior around the user. And to do this, of course, we need a fundamental part is that of me measuring human capabilities in order to have a complete understanding of the user. And based on this, we can provide tailored adaptation of the system. So not some sort of general profiles for uh, worker function uh, in the hierarchy of human resources, but uh, tailored adaptation, tailored on the subject, on the worker, and on the current state. And we had Nevertheless, some additional teaching and support for a uh, least skilled user. Um, the results I presented were related about um, one use case, uh, but uh, we had different, as I said, tests with other use cases and they were as well positive and satisfaction from the user was, uh, was quite, quite good. So, in particular, in terms of worker satisfaction, which which was which is I mean which is um, usually considered as a second thought or something that okay if it comes good, otherwise no matter as long as production and productivity are, are high. But I mean, this uh, worker satisfaction still influences the production and the productivity. And just one last concluding remark. I mean, the, our, with our project, uh, with our project and with other projects that were funded in the same um, Horizon 2020 call uh, about factories of the future, we funded a cluster because, of course, we had in common many activities and many ideas. And the main result of this cluster was that a white paper was produced. It's about human-centered factories, and it might contain some interesting means for people who work on these topics who are interested in that. So it might be useful. Maybe not, maybe yes. Okay, so this concludes my presentation. Um, I hope I was in time and uh, not fast. Um, yeah, don't yeah, worry, worry. I'm a little off, but uh, so, so I, 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 I
a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, also with uh, what Paul and Ismail presented, maybe there is some uh, interesting discussion there. Uh, yeah. Um, Hello, hi, you hear me? Sarah. Right. Yeah. Can you hear okay. me? Hello. Yeah. This is Sarah from Technalia. I have a question for Valeria. Um, you have mentioned some uh, psychophysiological signals uh, to detect the state of the worker. Um, have you worked in your um, project in these um, signals and um, afterwards detection? Yes, we did. Yeah, you have mentioned EG and GC, GSER and... Okay. Yeah, I mentioned a lot of them and yeah. uh, a year. Yeah. I mentioned a lot of them and of course, I mean, not all, them, not all of them were used in all the use cases because there were some specific constraints from the use cases. But um, we we uh, I mean we did use uh, we did measure heart rate and heart rate variability and mm -hmm. galvanic skin response and also eye activity in one of the use cases who did not need uh, that the user was moving around so we could mount the um, the eye tracker on the on the screen of the the system of the HMI and yeah. it, uh, follow the, the user and so we we, we tried to find um, uh, a compromise with the fact that these devices need to be uh, I mean that these signals uh, need to be measured in in a real scenario yeah and so but nevertheless we, we use some wearable technologies and yeah. uh, and we could detect these these signals and uh, in the case of in the use case I presented where we would have the comparison with the customary system uh, we could measure these signals under the two conditions and we experienced a, a reduction of uh, uh, cognitive effort of workers during the use of the inclusive system. Yeah, you're right, because we we work on this type of um, issues, you know, and uh, the problem here is that all these wearable devices are not uh, most of the times compatible with their protection equipment, you know, because some operators should, should wear some uh, equipment, so you, you need to put more things over them, you know, <laughs> And yeah, that normally it's a problem to measure this type of stuff. Yeah, it's a problem. You can you can reduce that problem, in my opinion, if you use some wearable device like a smartwatch or something like that, which is mm -hmm. not so uncomfortable to wear, but yeah. a, a backside does provide bad quality signals. Yeah, and yeah. And That's there are cool. also some important ethical issues that any of these devices rise. So yeah. we had the ethical committee and... Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Valeria, for your presentation. Are there any other questions? If not, uh, we continue with uh, uh, Foti Dimeas. Uh, Foti, are you there? Yes, yes. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Hello. So May I ask uh, Valeria to send in the chat the link from the last slide? Uh, the, this document seems to be very interesting. Yeah, of course. The white paper you mean? Yes, yes, yes. please. Yes, sure. please. <laughs> OK, can I share my screen? Yeah, you can and you must. OK. <laughs> <laughs> So let me just, uh, maybe you want to introduce yourself uh, briefly? Yes, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, uh, we can. My name is uh, Fotis Dimeas. Yes, so I'm a researcher in the robotics lab of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. And our university is coordinating the collaborate project 
on Horizon 2020. And in this presentation, I would like to talk to you about uh, some of the latest advances we have achieved in human-robot collaboration, particularly for assembly applications. So, uh, Collaborate is an ongoing project uh, that's funded by Horizon. Sorry. It's so about uh, developing... Sorry? May I ask you to go in the presentation mode? Right now we see your slides, if you can. Ah, okay, because I am, uh, I see, let me... Uh, if you cannot, we can this? the way it was. Yeah, perfect. Okay, better, okay. So our project is about uh, developing a human robot, uh, genuine human robot uh, collaboration, aiming to unlock the potential of uh, HRC in the industry. Uh, our consortium consists of uh, eight universities and research institutes, two SMEs and four industrial partners. It is coordinated by Professor Zoe Dulieri from uh, the Arsenal University of Thessaloniki in Greece. So our ambition is to make robots uh, learn how to cooperate with humans in order to jointly perform uh, assembly operations. To achieve this, we are developing uh, novel methodologies uh, for the robots to learn for the, from human demonstration, to be adaptable, to be ergonomic and to be safe. So we are building upon state-of-the-art methods to provide different modalities of human demonstration, to equip robotic manipulators and AGVs uh, with basic uh, collaboration skills and to provide uh, efficient safety strategies for a fenceless approach with, within an industrial production cell. We are focusing here on four use cases uh, trying to solve actual problems from the industry. These use cases uh, allow us to test our functionalities to a wide range of robots, from lightweight uh, mobile manipulators and collaborative robots uh, to heavy industrial manipulators. So in the next slides, I will provide some details for each one of these use cases, but I will focus on some of functionalities that we have recently developed in our research lab in our Seoul University. Starting with the use case for the assembly of our car starter, here we want a human to be able to demonstrate to the robot the placement of components. The way we have imagined this use case includes learning uh, from demonstration, either visually using cameras or kinesthetically. So the human will demonstrate the task and the robot will learn incrementally by adjusting online the allocation of roles with him. And here is how the setup currently looks like in our, in our partners in Yusuf Stefan Institute. The task for the robot is to pick the copper components from a tray on the right and place them in the fixture on the bench. The components that need to be assembled require very high accuracy, that is less than a millimeter. And even though there are cameras uh, that are necessary to find the pick and place coordinates, the accuracy of the cameras is not sufficient. So this is actually a peg in the whole problem with the additional complexity of the contact widths that are flexible, as you can see here. So the way we have uh, tried to solve this problem is by decoupling the teaching of the path, the trajectory and the velocity profile separately. And this reduces the cognitive load of the human. So in the first stage, the human demonstrates the path without considering the, the velocity. So we, instead of demonstrating the assembly, we demonstrate the disassembly kinesthetically and we encode it with uh, movement primitives. So having um, developed a methodology with the reversed movement primitives in the second uh, stage, uh, the human can uh, demonstrate the velocity profile for the assembly operation. And without, and the robot is guided automatically to the path. Uh, so here is actually the execution. Let me start the video. So this is what the robot has learned and uh, it wants to execute. It picks the first component and wants to place it to the, to the target. Even though we are in execution mode, 
the human can intervene. For example, let's say that we want to modify the trajectory or we want to modify the velocity. So this is very easy now with this uh, formulation of movement primitives. And let me speed up the video. If you want to move to the second uh, uh, ring, we can pick it. And let's say that we have a vision system that uh, sets the target, but it is a wrong target. So the robot collides. So we have come up with, a, let's say, with a phase stopping. Uh, it's not something new, but uh, using the forces, we can stop the execution of the robot. The robot can reverse back to the previous state of the trajectory, and then when we have the correct uh, target, we can accurately place the component there. So the second use case I would like to talk to you about uh, also comes from the automotive industry, and it is about collaborative handling of a large windshield for quality inspection and pre-assembly. Here we have developed methodologies based on movement primitives also, that the robot is able to estimate the intentions of the human and become proactive. Um, so unlike the previous use case, here we are dealing with a very heavy industrial robot with very high inertia. And this is how the setup looks like. So the object we want to manipulate is very big and it is manipulated using two special sensorized handles uh, as you can see here. So in order to replicate this uh, robot in a lab, um, we use two smaller robots, but we're using the equivalent inertia. And we came up with a, a solution for variable admittance control for large inertia objects. And the reason we are using this, sorry, let me start this video. So if we use admittance control, the standard admittance with very small values, to reduce the apparent inertia in damping, we might get to instability. So there are some minimum values that we have to respect, uh, which however have a negative impact on the performance. And this is how our, uh, so we have developed a variable damping strategy in order to manipulate a robot with high inertia, but adjusting the damping appropriately to be easy to manipulate, but also to be accurate at the positioning. And we, we prepared then uh, a comparative study, and we see that we show that uh, there is less energy consumed by the by the human. It is most more intuitive for the human, and it's most uh, it's better uh, for the uh, for the placement. So the next use case is the assembly line of a TV. Uh, here. The human and the robot uh, share the same workspace and need to perform parallel operations. Okay, so the robot uh, wants to place a circuit board on the TV frame, and uh, the human fixes these boards into place with screws. But in addition, here we have some other logistic operations uh, with the AGVs bringing circuit boards and uh, removing empty trays. So our um, solution here. Uh, involves uh, either visual or kinesthetic demonstration. Uh, and this video that we have prepared with our collaborators in uh, CERT, you can see initially the teaching of the robot where a human uh, is using kinesthetic guidance to pick and place each board to the correct location. The first PCB is demonstrated and then the second one. So this is the task cycle uh, of the robot. Okay. So each segment here is encoded with uh, dynamic movement primitives. And we have developed methods that can now encode correctly both the translation and the and the vector the rotational coordinates. Using uh, depth sensors, uh, we can detect the scene and generalize this primitive so that the robot can move accurately to the new targets. We have also extended the DMP framework so that the robot can execute uh, the learned path towards a target that is moving. This is particularly useful here, not this video, but in the actual production line where this TV will be on a moving conveyor. So for safety, which is very important, we have developed uh, with our collaborators uh, dynamic constraints to avoid collisions of the robot with the human. Using advanced uh, methods for skeleton tracking without using markets, 
on the vision, we can calculate this collision avoidance signal and adjust the trajectory of the robot to avoid contacts with the entire kinematic chain of the manipulator and not only with the end effector. But because uh, using cameras, there can be occlusions, uh, there might be a problem here. So we have developed a second level of safety as a failover. And this failover keeps the robot compliant to external forces so the robot is safe during unexpected contacts. Our solution in this, the problem can be seen better in this video, where uh, the novelty here is that the robot uh, can remain compliant in order to be safe during the execution, but at the same time, it can accurately follow the reference trajectory and reach the target with zero error. The uh, final use case uh, comes from the aircraft manufacturing. Here, the human needs to work together with the robot to rivet an aircraft frame. And currently, this operation is performed uh, manually. And the, and the worker who is now from the robot side has to provide a lot of physical effort and gets into non-ergonomic uh, postures. So in this uh, picture, you can see the solution we have proposed with the robot manipulator on top of a mobile, mobile base. And this robot needs to get into very narrow spaces in this uh, float while holding a specialized tool to counteract the forces for the riveting, uh, because from the other side, there will be a human with a riveting can. Uh, so the knowledge here that we want to include to the robot is quite limited, and this robot needs to uh, heavily depend on active perception. But I will not go into further details for this use case because currently it is under heavy development. And here I conclude my presentation. Uh, this was a very brief overview of the collaborative projects and some of the solutions uh, we have proposed in National University. So if you want to learn more about uh, our project and our solutions, you can visit our website, you can visit our social media, uh, or you can send me an email. Okay, so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, for this for your uh, presentation. Um, I have a quick question. In, in the last use case that you showed, isn't it dangerous even to leave the robot in a compliant way because it, there is a weight in the arm, right? This can be kind of heavy and surprising for the worker that might have some um, unwanted uh, response, <laughs> like pushing uh, the robot away and breaking it. Yes, uh, in uh, all of the use cases we are performing, uh, uh, let's say, a safety analysis uh, in order to see possible dangers. So if you're talking about this use case, there's always here separation from, uh, the ro from the robot and the human by a structure. And we also have uh, laser sensors that uh, prevent the motion of the robot when the human coach gets into the workspace, unlike the other use cases I showed you earlier, where we have active collaboration and sharing of workspace. So uh, the, me the methodology that makes the robot compliant can only be used uh, with the robot that uh, can be controlled using uh, to, to send by sending torque commands, uh, because we want to be compliant to the entire arm and not only to the end effector. And this can happen. This cannot be happen if you have a force torque sensor just at the wrist. So here we are dealing with a different safety strategy, and uh, we don't want the robot. We cannot make the robot this particular robot compliant. So we need to deal with uh, more uh, standard strategies that can reduce the operation, the speed of the robot when the human uh, gets into close proximity. Mm -hmm. There is another question from Sara. Yes, well, um, there are two questions from Manik and Radhi. Uh, one is who built this demonstrator? I don't know which demonstrator Marie is referring to. Yes, uh, I was talking about the industrial one. I think it's use case two. 
Uh, Marie has, yeah? Yeah, that one. So this demonstrator is currently being uh, in the setup. That's why I don't have any pictures yet, only uh, a simulation. Mm -hmm. And this is in the car factory of uh, Maserati. And it oh, is okay. being uh, built by CRF, Fiat mm -hmm. Research Center. And uh, so following my, my following question is then, is there more information available about this application or this demonstrator being built? Uh, there are some uh, information available as uh, public deliverables. You can find them in the CORDIS uh, website of our project. This information are public and uh, more information uh, will be made available uh, towards uh, the end of the project it will be, let's say, in a few months from now. Okay. All right, thank you. More questions? If not, we go, thank you, Fotis, and we go. Thank you for inviting me. To the next presentation uh, with Nestor. Nestor, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, can you see me? I'm Hello. Share my screen. Uh, nice meeting you. So while you, yeah. We see your um, your slides, and you are a, a principal investigator at Eureka's Robotics and Automation, which is uh, um, located in, in Catalonia. Is it in Barcelona? Where is it exactly? Yeah. Uh, so the main location is in, in Barcelona. We we have several locations uh, around the the country. All right, so you will be uh, talking about um, co cognitive robotics and AI for an effective industrial HR. Uh, and then you present the share work case, which is another uh, EU uh, project that is collaborating with HR research. Thank yeah. you. Take it away. Yeah, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nestor. Uh, I'm the responsible of the collaborative robotics uh, research line in Jericat, and today I will present at a glance the Shareware project. The Shareware project is a four-year-long European project whose main objective is to bring safe and effective human-robot cooperation into the industrial work environment. The Shareware consortium is composed of uh, 15 partners from six different countries across Europe, including uh, four end users coming from the automotive sector, the railway, capital goods and metal uh, industries. ShareWorks uh, endows an industrial work environment of the necessary intelligence and methods for the effective adoption of human road cooperation without uh, fences. The project objectives are the design of an evolving knowledge base and environment cognition, the development of a human aware task planner and motion planner, the development of a multimodal human robot communication system, and the development of methods for overcoming human related barriers and ensuring a successful integration. The solution proposed by ShareWork will be able to select the best tasks to be performed by the robot and their timing based on the, the task being executed by the, the human. The system will also inform the human about the next action and understand the, the human request. This will allow the robot to adjust speed and torque to ensure the worker safety. Moreover, uh, not only the robot will recognize the human tasks, but also it will learn new tasks from observation. In addition, uh, the system will evaluate the worker economics and will provide uh, corrections to improve it and avoid uh, possible injuries. Now uh, we have executed more or less half of the, the project. So we have already defined the robotic solutions and the system architecture. Uh, we finished the development of the, all the necessary uh, models composing the, the shower project. So we are uh, currently uh, working on the preliminary system integration into several uh, mock-up uh, pilots to optimize the, the system components in order to prepare the, the final phase in which the, the performance on the functionalities of the whole system will be evaluated in the four real uh, industrial scenarios. 
So uh, going for the use case, uh, the first one is uh, based on Alstom uh, in the railway uh, sector. This uh, use case is focused. Uh, sorry. Uh, this uh, use case is focused uh, on the assembly of doors and window frames for uh, tramways. The frames are composed of four metallic parts that must be assembled in the, the corners using uh, silicone and afterward these corners are riveted. So in fact, uh, the assembly of the whole frame uh, can be considered as uh, four identical sub-assemblies, which contain some low value added and repetitive tasks. Some uh, important constraints related to the silicon application is that the, the silicon must be correctly applied within the contact area and spread uh, evenly. And in the riveting, the, the tool use is uh, heavy, so it's more or less like uh, five kilos. And uh, the recoil of the tool uh, causes some uh, serious injuries after a uh, long use on the worker's uh, shoulders. So uh, for this reason, with the Sherwood project, the robot will be able to take care of these tasks and let the, the operator just control the robot and check uh, the quality of the, the assembly. So uh, you can see here the, the proposed solution uh, where we will use a, a cobot mounted on a linear axis that will be able to uh, move the robot to each of the different uh, corners while the, the, the worker is uh, performing some other tasks in the contrary corners. The next uh, use case is, uh, is based on the voice work. Uh, this uh, use case is focused on the assembly of uh, servo rotatory tables. In this assembly operator uh, operation, the human operator must uh, tie a lot of bolts, which is a low value added task. Uh, moreover, the correct torque must be applied to each of the screws and also the, the screws need to be tightened in a specific sequence. So uh, this uh, produces a lot of uh, human errors that will be solved by introducing the robot assistance in this task. Uh, this uh, use case has a second task, which uh, faces the, the quality inspection of the CAM followers. Um, in this task, the, this input shaft uh, must be rotated while observation, observing the, the motion of the followers uh, through this uh, mirror and two openings uh, over here. Uh, the rotation must be controlled both uh, at torque and uh, velocity level, which uh, causes a physical fatigue. So the average, the average is like uh, 20 rotations at 250 Newton meter, which is a high physical demand for the workers. So the solution uh, we plan here is to let the shareware system move the input shaft uh, controlled by, by human gestures. Uh, hence, the, the operator can focus only on the, the quality inspection and can reduce the injuries to the, the physical fatigue. The, uh, you can see here the proposed solution where the, the cobot is uh, mounted on the work, uh, working table. In <coughs> the cobot is the responsible for the, the screwing uh, of the, the nuts. And also you can see here the motor which uh, is responsible for uh, rotating the, the input shaft while the, the worker can uh, easily uh, check through the, the windows the, the quality of the, the camp followers. The next use case is the Zvezon Chamber, which is uh, focused on the load and unload of pallets in CNC uh, machines. In the chamber facilities, the parts to be uh, fixed are uh, mounted um, on multi fixturing devices, call it uh, pallets, which is uh, this thing over here. Uh, the project aims to assist the operators with the screw and unscrew operations, which are so repetitive and low value added, and also to assist the, the operator with the check of the, the parts, since there is a considerable number of pallet configuration, which is causing a lot of uh, mounting errors. 
So consider that Tenbra is producing more than 200 different products. So you can imagine the, the big number of different uh, mounting configuration on these pallets. Uh, in addition, the, the operators are uh, subject to a high uh, workload when moving uh, metal parts. So thanks to the robot assistance, the, the operator ergonomics will uh, surely uh, improve. In the proposed solution, uh, a cobot is uh, mounted on a country, which uh, helps the operator in the load uh, of the pallet. Of the pallet. Uh, the robot by itself is able to identify the, the metal parts to be machined and grasp the, the fixture to um, uh, fix the, the metal parts on the, on the pallet and put the, 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 this piece on the, onto the pallet. Finally, is the, we have the, the set use case, which is focused on the mounting and unmounting uh, the front rear back uh, doors and also the, the hood on dummy chassis outside the, the mine the main uh, production line for those uh, parts which have some defects and must be repainted. So uh, different parts from different different car models must be processed in this uh, workstation. These parts must manually trans uh, be transported to a lateral uh, shelf, which is, uh, which is a process which is not efficient, and then mounted back on the, the chassis while the operator uh, lift uh, them manually uh, and hold uh, the, the, the hood, for example, in that position while other uh, workers um, do the assembly operation on the, on the chassis, which is for sure a, a task which is not uh, ergonomics. So the idea here is to let the robot uh, to autonomously store the, the parts and hold and to hold them while the operators do the the assembly operation. This will let uh, free the operator hands reducing the, the physical fatigue and also increasing uh, productivity. So uh, in the proposed solution, you can see uh, two robots uh, at both sides of the uh, transport uh, line. Uh, these uh, robots will have access to all the faces of the car and also they have access to the lateral shelf well, uh, where they will uh, store the, the parts and recover them to mount it them uh, when the, the chassis arrives. And yeah, the robot will uh, lift the, the parts and hold the, the weight while the, the operators perform the assembly uh, operator, uh, operation on the, on the chassis. And this uh, for, sh for sure will uh, increase the, the human work uh, economics. So uh, thank you for your attention. This was uh, the Shower project, uh, shortly at the glance. Now, if you have uh, questions. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Nestor. Uh, are there any questions? Maybe we can discuss later, if possible, on the impact of having a complete automation versus um, having the human in between uh, in the work pipeline. So those are relevant issues for uh, having an economic impact in positive or negative, we have to see uh, who agrees on what. Uh, but yeah, it's a reality that we cannot um, avoid having complete automation, but the human factor is also very important and should be taken care of somehow in the economic impact. Uh, so if not, uh, if there are no more questions, I would go, uh, thank you again, Nasser, we go to the, next, to the next uh, presentation. Uh, I don't know if Daniel uh, is there. Daniel Camilleri, if not, because I don't see him here, I don't know if he's having trouble with teams. If uh, then Panagiotis, if you can just take uh, over and maybe you can present uh, before. But perfect. Sure, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Okay, great. So, um, Jan, we start with your presentation and uh, 
So, uh, Panagiotis, you are a researcher at the uh, University of Patras in Greece. Maybe exactly. You, mention, you want to mention the laboratory, which is a long name. <laughs> so, I'd sure. like to present this and if you share your slides. Yeah, just one moment to share my screen. Yeah. I guess you can see my screen right now. Yeah, we can. Great. So I think also the visual input for the long uh, laboratory name uh, also <laughs> helps. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Panagiotis Karagiannis, and I'm from the Laboratory for Manufacturing Systems and Automation uh, from Greece, from University of Patras. Probably most of you know the short name LMS, which is easier also to remember. Right. And uh, actually, I'm a research engineer in uh, in uh, in this lab for quite a few years now, and uh, okay. I am uh, doing my PhD. Would you go in the presentation mode if you can? Ah, sure. Uh, one moment. Let me yeah. transfer you a bit on the top. <laughs> okay. Now I think it's better. Okay. Uh, so, the topic of my presentation is uh, in general to describe a few methods and technologies for human robot collaborative uh, cells that we have uh, uh, worked uh, the past years in uh, different uh, European uh, funded projects. Um, now I'm in full screen mode, so if someone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or we can discuss in the end, but I cannot see any raised hands and chat, so uh, I will try to be quick and efficient. So here you can see uh, a bit uh, the outlook of my presentation. Uh, so we will uh, discuss a bit about current uh, solution in manufacturing. And by current, we mean without having a human robot collaboration uh, aspects inside. Then we will present uh, our vision, let's say, from uh, the future that we, we are very happy to see um, this future a bit starting to shape in the current factories uh, bit by bit. And then we will get into a bit more detail for um, a, a few methods and technologies that are uh, important in order to implement a such a cell. <clears throat> and in the end, we will show you a few industrial use cases uh, that we have uh, realized in our laboratory premises from past uh, European uh, projects. So uh, starting from the from the introduction, why uh, we want to have um, a human robot collaborative uh, cell. What is the motivation motivation uh, behind that? So right now, uh, as you can see also in the top right image, there are fixed uh, manufacturing lines uh, that they are dedicated to specific products and the automation systems are uh, uh, fixed to this uh, dedicated product. So it's a bit difficult to update the um, uh, these lines to introduce new products or to make customizations for the uh, for the customers it's uh, it's very time consuming to test a new line before finally install it in order to replace the old ones um, there are a lot of uh, unexpected events i'm i'm pretty sure that you all know that a manufacturing environment is very dynamic and it is quite difficult, if I not say impossible, to predict uh, all the different uh, possible events that may occur. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's very part dedicated, not so flexible to changes uh, and uh, to introduce new products. And um, a, a lot of uh, time and money is also lost from uh, for the maintenance activities and the breakdown uh, cases that make the whole production uh, to stop. Uh, also, from the human perspective, there are some disadvantages, let's say, uh, which are related to the working conditions uh, of, uh, of the humans. So, uh, the operators uh, are lifting uh, heavy loads, they have uh, to make a lot of non-ergonomic operations, as you can see also from the uh, bottom right um, image, the human operator should work in a very narrow spaces and do repetitive uh, tasks, leading to MSDs and uh, a lot of stress during the, um, their uh, operation and their activities. And this leads also um, for them to take long uh, leaves and leading to production uh, downtimes. A third pillar is the market requirements. So 
nowadays everything uh, runs in a very high pace. So similarly, the market needs are changing very fast, and the industries have very facing are facing a lot of struggles and a lot of difficulties in order to keep up with those uh, needs and requirements. So. Um, also, I, I said at the beginning that uh, it is very difficult to make custom products um, uh, for uh, for the customers based on their uh, requirements. Uh, so the transition from the mass production model that was necessary um, before in order to produce a lot of products uh, to and offer a lot of products to the market now is starting moving towards uh, the mass customization uh, model which means that each one of us requires um, the same product but to customize it uh, based on their likes and this creates a lot of problems during the design of the manufacturing uh, lines and the design of the products um, uh, as a consequence. Uh, moving on, uh, here uh, we have gathered uh, a few of the, uh, the challenges that have been described before, how they can be addressed uh, from the technologies and the human uh, operator in order to lead to this final idea and final objective of having a human robot uh, collaborative cell. So starting from uh, from the robots, robots are uh, machines, are mechatronic machines, if I may say, uh, that are able to handle uh, uh, high payload, uh, they have a high payload and they can handle heavy objects in a very easy and efficient way with a very high accuracy and uh, they can perform all day and all night uh, repetitive tasks with a very, very small um, uh, possibility of uh, probability of error. Also, they can be uh, their capabilities can be easily enhanced by simply uh, introducing some flexible uh, automation tools to their end effectors, uh, for example. So uh, they can be easily updated and adapted to the different requirements of the industrial lines. On the other side, uh, as um, as we said, the human operator is quite important, but the idea is to avoid. Uh, having the human operator doing repetitive tasks, but um, use uh, the human brain and take advantage of the cognition capabilities and the dexterity that the human hand has. And uh, right now it is not easily achieved by the machines. Also, uh, the human operator uh, has a lot of information uh, to receive from the environment and not just because there are a lot of machines and automation tools that exist around him, but also uh, because the production uh, status and the production lines right now are very complex and for this reason they need to be aware with a lot of uh, information. Uh, moving at the bottom left uh, corner, of course, an important aspect are sensors that uh, take information and data from the production line, from uh, from the resources, from the products, the parts, and so on. And based on this information, the automation tools in general can make their own uh, decision. And a last pillar, which is also a very important for a human robot collaborative cell, is how to combine all these things sensors and the resources in order to provide the necessary information at the right time and the right place in a format that is uh, easily uh, adapted to the needs of the different resources. So the human operator cannot understand bits and bytes, of course. They need to have images or text in their um, native language and so on. So in the center of all these activities, the industries are trying to foster an coexistence in the assembly lines between humans and robots, that they are able to share the workplace and share the tasks in order to solve the problems and the challenges that I described in my previous slides uh, that would increase the production um, uh, rate and minimize the delays of giving the products to the markets. Um, 
this is a bit of state of the art, so I don't want to, to take much uh, time on this slide. Um, yes, pretty much everyone is uh, very familiarized with uh, human robot collaborative uh, solutions. We have also seen from the previous speakers a lot of examples like universal uh, robots or the KUKA uh, collaborative uh, robots. Also, ABB and DLR are working with a collaborative uh, solution. And on the left side, side of the slide, you can see uh, industrial robots, the heavy, high payload industrial robots that are traditionally used in the manufacturing uh, right now, and also uh, big uh, machines that are capable of handling heavy parts like this, uh, this one that handles um, an axle, the rear axle of a car that weighs 35 kilos and transfers it this uh, axle uh, through the different stations in order the assembly operations to take uh, place. Also, another example and a key uh, technology that uh, has been uh, heavily used uh, in human robot collaborative environments uh, is the AR technology. So this, uh, this is uh, very popular, let's say, because it is very immersive. It can provide um, information, uh, as I said before, in a very human acceptable, let's say, uh, way, uh, because uh, you can show 3D images in the real environment alongside with the real environment. So either the human operator or the engineer, depending on, on the application, uh, can have a better understanding of what they are designing and on what they are planning. And the importance of this technology is quite visible because uh, we can uh, see that it is used by a lot of um, uh, by a lot of people in different stages during uh, in the manufacturing. So we it is used in the factory planning, in the guidance of the assembly operations, in designing new products for um, undertaking the maintenance activities. Um, in uh, in the assembly factories and uh, for programming uh, creating new programs for uh, for the robots so as you can see it has a quite broad uh, acceptance uh, and applicability now uh, moving back to the human robot collaborative cell here uh, we would like to share with you our vision uh, let's say from a future factory that as i said before we start to taking a bit more uh, of shape uh, in in the real industrial uh, lines. Um, in this collaborative cell, we can see the humans and the operators to work together and to combine the technologies, the four pillars that I described before, um, together in order to have a higher flexibility and reconfigurability, to achieve higher flexibility and reconfigurability uh, on the different resources, uh, on the processes, and as well on the products that we need to prepare at the end um, of, of the line and provide to the customers. So, uh, in my following slides, I will try uh, to explain a bit more detail these four pillars that you can see in the orange, gray, green, and yellow, gold um, boxes. So, starting from the left one, there are robotic solution. The robot is a key resource for a human robot collaborative cell. Uh, that is equipped with different tools, as we said before, or even with some uh, more advanced mechatronic um, devices like assembly machines in order to execute a specific operation. Uh, also in the center, there are the sensors that are required in order to receive feedback from the manufacturing environment. As I said, it's a very dynamic uh, environment and it has uh, a lot of changes that are taking place. On the right side is the human operator that is able to grasp the robot, as you can see also from this figure, and move it in different places by adapting or fine-tuning, for example, uh, the robotic operation. And in the background, again, there is the control center with the human operator that has an overview of the production status and um, on the PCs are running a centralized synchronization and control framework. Um, so, let's say this is uh, our vision for such uh, future model. Now, starting a bit in more detail about uh, the hardware, 
Um, as I said, we would like to have robotic solutions. Uh, this can be either static robots that are fixed on the ground and the product goes, let's say, uh, the line passes in front of this uh, robot if we are talking for a bigger robot, but also there is the possibility to use mobile resources, so mobile robots, I'm sorry, that have one or multiple arms. The, there will be smart and effectors that also have their own degrees of, feed, of freedom to enhance the degrees of freedom that are offered already by the robot. There are different connection points uh, between the robot and the different tools. So this can um, help the robot to change the, the grippers that uh, he can use, that the robot can use uh, to execute the different tasks or um, different end effectors in order to uh, grasp machines that can undertake uh, different operations. Um, as we said before, robots have a higher accuracy. They are not affected by environmental conditions. Also, they can work day and night. They don't need special temperature, let's say, like the humans uh, required, um, or they don't need uh, very strict, if I may, if I may be more uh, correct, very strict um, temperature and humidity conditions. They don't need light, for example, they can operate in completely darkness and so on. So they are not affected by the environmental conditions and uh, they can handle different parts they can assemble different parts but again as we said before they have i'm sorry they have a limited capability in terms of um, uh, in terms of handling parts uh, they don't match the dexterity as of now at least of the human uh, operators uh, moving on with the sensors, the sensors are using uh, perception algorithms that process the data and by sensors and perception we speak about a very broad, um, uh, very broad uh, technology, uh, we, we speak for a very broad range of technologies. This would include vision systems like cameras or LIDAR sensors. This uh, could include uh, piezoelectric sensors that can understand the touch. Um, they can, we can speak about um, electromagnetic sensors that can understand a metal or distinguish a metal from a plastic, for example. So uh, by sensors, we mean any kind of um, automation tool that can recognize a specific uh, condition. And by using a smart algorithm in the background, we can take this information and adapt uh, the working conditions uh, accordingly. Uh, moving on, and here I would uh, stay a bit longer, we have the human-robot interaction technologies, uh, which are of very high importance uh, because, um, as you can understand, we are speaking about a very highly automated environment that uh, uh, has its own cognition and uh, it can take its own decisions. And for this reason, the, hum the human operator should be kept inside uh, the loop of this decision making. And um, the human should be aware of the activities that the other resources uh, are doing inside the cell. And let's say this, this technology can help the human operator feel more comfortable to work uh, next to a machine as if they are working next to a human co-worker. So these technologies help us to um, enable, facilitate this acceptance, let's say, of, uh, of the human operators to this new uh, industrial paradigm. And also because we are talking about uh, human uh, uh, operators, there is also other difficulties because beyond the technology that you need to select to apply. Uh, and this goes more to the psychology uh, factor. Uh, so this technology should not create stress to the operators. They can be very, they should be very uh, intuitive. They should be very immersive and they should be helpful, let's say, for the operators in order to accept them. Uh, moving on, uh, we would like to, uh, I would like to speak for two main technologies that we have developed in, uh, in past projects and we are still working uh, on them and evolving in them uh, in our current projects. And the one goes to uh, AR technology that I have spoken before, but also we would like to include also 
um, uh, applications that can run on uh, smart devices like smart watches that can be wear by the operator and they can be easily follow let's say the operator wherever it goes so we don't need to use big machines or big uh, pcs on workstations that the operator has to come and go in order to receive um, information but the technology is right now at such level that the operator can wear a, a device and receive information um, on from the production uh, line so starting with the AR technology, I will give you a few examples how this technology can be used. So the operator is wearing um, smart glasses, AR glasses, and uh, through the, the lenses of the glass, he can see the real world, but also he can see um, 3D models or instructions from uh, for the production uh, for the activity that the and the operation that he needs to undertake so this means that right now we don't need to stick to very uh, precise and um, uh, very exact instructions of doing repetitive tasks but these tasks can be dynamically updated uh, for each product depending, for example, on the requirements of the end user and the, and the customer that will use this product. So we can dynamically provide information for the specific part, how the operator should customize it based on the requirements of a customer. Also, the operator can receive information about the model that is processing. So he can have a background knowledge for this model and adapt, as I said, uh, some custom information and some custom operations for this uh, specific model or can receive information for how much time or how much uh, how much remaining time he has to process uh, a part or how much time um, it took him to work on a product uh, and, and so on. So this can give the operator an overview and an idea about the whole production, how it is proceeding uh, during uh, the day. Of course, all this information uh, are not locally stored uh, inside the device because, as I said, they are dynamic information and they are adapted to the specific needs of the, the specific production of the day, probably, or of the specific shift. Uh, they are stored in a central um, execution system and they are dynamically uh, sent to each operator based on the station that the operator is working. Also, uh, before I spoke about uh, acceptance uh, and increasing awareness of the human operator for uh, the industrial environment. This means that the robot, uh, which is the main uh, actor also in, uh, in the cell, uh, is doing specific movements or the robot uh, can be restricted inside some safety zones, let's say. And there are other safety zones that only the human can enter. But these are programmed inside the robot controller or they are stored, let's say, in a central PLC. And the human operator is not aware um, doesn't have this information, is not aware of what the robot will do. And for this reason, using the AR glasses, he's able to see, for example, in the top screen, as you can see, um, the end effector, the, tra the trajectory of the end effector that uh, the robot will execute, which in this case it's a straight line, let's say, to approach the one part to the other. But also in the bottom screen, you can see that he can see some safety zones. So with the red, for example, he can see the safety zone in which the, um, the robot uh, is instructed to stay inside. And the green zone is the area that the robot is uh, instructed not to enter because it's the zone of the human operator. So in this way, the human operator, um, imagine you see just the two parts without this information, is not seeing just the robot moving in the area without knowing when it will start or well, where it will end, but he, he can see a line or he can see a zone, a box, inside which the robot is moving. And this increases his awareness about uh, his co-workers, as, as, as I said before. Now, moving to the other uh, technology, the smartwatch uh, technology, uh, here are a bit uh, details on how the application is running, but the main idea is that uh, each operator has a specific um, uh, smartwatch that uh, extract, extract, 
tracks a QR code and using the camera from the AR glasses, it matches this smartwatch with the AR glasses. So the system can identify him and know uh, the specific operator wears a specific model of glasses and a specific model of smartwatch. And then the execution system can send instructions and information only to this operator and to his or her devices. Uh, what this information includes now for the smartwatch application, it can be a button in order for the operator to inform the system to, uh, uh, about his task that it has been uh, completed. Or another example in the next slide is to activate uh, another perception functionality, which includes audio commands. So in case that uh, he wants to make the robot start or stop for some reason or to make a pause, he can verbally provide this um, instruction. And also the smartwatch application can be used to interact also with other devices like the AR glasses. So the human operator has a, a broad spectrum of buttons to select and um, choose what kind of information wants to see in his field of view. So the operator doesn't see 3D models or the trajectory, for example, of the robot uh, all the time, but he receives this information and when he or she wants, she can uh, remove this information from uh, the field of view. Uh, in this way, you can understand that the capabilities are almost limitless and they can reach our, they are limited only, let's say, by our imagination. Uh, the main idea that I would like you to keep from these uh, two technologies is that uh, using wearable devices, the operator can uh, send information to the automation system, to a central control platform, receive information from this platform and also interact uh, with, uh, with the applications that are working on the devices that uh, the operator is using. Last but not least, I move to the uh, final um, uh, technology, which is the centralized synchronization and control uh, mechanism, which now we go beyond um, some uh, uh, fixed automation solutions like PLCs, but we are focusing more on service-based technologies that are running on, um, on PCs. Typically, we use a lot the ROS uh, environment and the ROS framework, in, especially in the research uh, area, we really love uh, ROS. And hopefully, uh, with the necessary updates, this will also move to the um, uh, factories. And uh, the, 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 the algorithms behind this, uh, the, the algorithms that are running uh, behind these PCs uh, are responsible to process the sensor data, to send instructions to the different resources on what they need to do and when they need to do it. They enable the communication between the different applications that are running on wearable devices like I described before, but also they have the dexterity to provide information based on the sensor data that they are receiving in order to adapt to the changes uh, that the uh, human, the, the industrial factories uh, have, um, uh, they are having. Here you can okay. see- Panagiotis, we have yes. to close because we are running out of time. Oh, okay. So uh, wrap up. If you can, please. Okay, one minute more. So I will skip this slide. It's about the control uh, uh, and integration. Thank you for the, the reminder, Anna. Here you can see integration, how the different technologies are combined together. And I will move very quickly to uh, the industrial use cases. So here we had a case study with uh, uh, Tofas factory for the assembly of the real axle um, uh, of a car uh, with uh, uh, the axle wheel group. And the, the robot had to carry the heavy parts and the human had to do only the screwing uh, process. So the delicate uh, process, let's say. And another application was from the Electrolux uh, factory uh, where the operator should uh, place um, uh, some tapes on, uh, on, uh, on the back of a uh, red refrigerator and the robot should place um, a, a hot foam 
that uh, was used for sealing a, a case for the refrigerator. So the conclusion very, very quickly is that we minimize the costs and we minimize the effort to update uh, the current uh, factory. So we increase the flexibility and we increase the dynamicity of current uh, systems. Also, the operators have higher safety feeling because they receive information and they interact intuitively with um, the environment. Uh, from the main control factor platform, we have um, online decision making based on sensor data and we have an overall control of uh, the situation, let's say, in the production lines. And on the specific use cases that I have shown uh, earlier, the, we saw um, shorter loading times and um, the, the resources have run uh, the one after the other without facing any lags or any delays uh, in the production. Uh, lastly, here are a few publications that are relevant that we have made from uh, our uh, laboratory. And this was my last uh, presentation. So I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Panagiotis. That was very uh, comprehensive talk uh, and very clear. Thank so. You. Do we have any questions for Panagiotis? I think everyone wants to go to lunch now. <laughs> um, so, well, my question was about how whether you tested the model where the user is uh, or the worker is using the wearables, for instance. Have you tested on site that solution? And how Within within this uh, the projects that I, I mentioned before, um, we have not tested. There have been other projects that uh, such uh, technologies have been uh, tested, and we know uh, also from the partners that we are working with that uh, they have also adapted um, this method these methods right now in production lines. Um, for example, we are working uh, in in this project. We, you saw the Komao robots, and we know from Komao that they have. Um, uh, introduced wearable devices um, to new uh, factories uh, from the FCA group that they also belong to. And uh, we have not, again, uh, made any kind of uh, in, uh, investigation with questioners and, and so on, but we know from them that they, there has been high acceptance of these technologies and the operators uh, are working and they are happy uh, using these uh, the, the wearables um, as a technology inside the factories. Okay, all right. So um, thank you again, Panagiotis. And oh, actually, so thank you very much. We we are at uh, lunchtime, and I think we lost one speaker. So um, I don't know what happened to Daniel Camilleri. Uh, so what I propose is to go for lunch uh, now and um, which are, we are perfectly on time right now and uh, we resume at um, what is it 14:10, uh, so at 2:10. Uh, if everyone agree, we have two more uh, not this we, we went through already <laughs> so, um, uh, we come back for the last two talks and uh, to wrap up the workshop. So don't go away, stick around, have a lovely half an hour lunch, and I'll see you. We'll see you uh, at uh, two ten, ten after two. So enjoy lunch. Okay, thank you, Anna. See you.